Hey, it's James from Marketing for Restaurants here. Welcome to episode 163 of Secret Sauce, the restaurant marketing podcast. Tips for hiring in your restaurant in a post-COVID world. Some restaurants are quiet, lose money, and the owner works 70 hours a week. Other restaurants are busy, profitable, and the owners work a few hours a day. What's the difference? They have a secret sauce. Join James from Marketing for Restaurants as he helps you come up with your recipe for restaurant success, your secret sauce. Hey everyone, welcome back to the podcast. Today we are going to be covering probably the hot topic item amongst all of our customers. For everyone that we're working with, we're always saying, you know, what's your number one issue? And nine times out of 10, it is getting staff. It's really quite a dire situation. And the interesting thing is, this, as far as I can tell, is a global crisis. Uh, Customers in the United States, customers in the UK, uh, definitely Australia, New Zealand. There is just a shortage of workers out there, a shortage of people who want to work in restaurants, and it's making it very difficult. And we see this pan out in number of scenarios. We've seen it where places are closing on their less profitable days, which sadly is often on a Sunday. Got If you're in a jurisdiction where there's expensive penalty rates, uh, often it's the Sunday that gets cut first because it's the most marginal day of the week. We're also seeing some places really sort of fall apart at the seams just because they're still trying to do everything that they would normally do back in the day, you know, back in 2019, before all of the things that have occurred in the restaurant industry that occurred that have occurred over the last two years before they sort of uh, hit. I've seen it where places, and it may be the fact that they've got staff away sick. Uh, we were at one restaurant and they apologize for the long wait between entrees and mains, which was about 60 minutes. And they said that they had three staff off with COVID and a couple more isolating. Or it could just be that they just can't get the staff. So what we're going to do today, we're going to look at why it is such a big issue. We're then going to look at some of the things that you can do before you get to the point where you need to hire. Now, admittedly, yes, you probably need to hire, but there's a couple of things that can make that dire situation a little less dire. We're going to look at operations because labor is now a absolutely critical resource for a restaurant. So this is the one that you need to be looking at. So from an operational point of view, what is it that you can do so that you're maximizing the return that you get from the labor that you've got? And then finally, we're going to look at some of the tips that we're seeing smart restaurants use to be able to hire successfully. And we all know how difficult that is, don't we? So first off, why is it such an issue? We've looked at some of the data that's coming out from various countries about why people are leaving their jobs. And we've also done a lot of talking to people about work conditions, different employers, different employees, just to try and get a read on what it is that people are thinking and why this is happening. So the first thing is that a lot of people have left in the last 12 months. Some of these people were due to retire. And when COVID came, it was, why would I retire? There's nothing that I can do anyway. So, and some of them were really quite worried about what the future left. So, right, they deferred their retirement. As things have started to open up, they've taken their retirement package. This is a natural part of attrition that was sort of delayed and is now sort of happening all at once. So that makes the figures look a little bit ordinary to start off with. Secondly, we're seeing this, so not so much in the restaurant industry, but a lot of people are looking for flexibility in their work now. So whether some people need to work as many hours as they were working, we're very much seeing it. So we we run a couple of companies. We've got an IT company. We are very much seeing people choosing flexibility, particularly around work from home. Now, in a restaurant, that doesn't really matter because it's uh, obviously a locational-based work. But for knowledge workers, definitely the ability to remain at home. And we've been hiring people because we've been flexible in our approach to where people are working. We've been picking up people who are great employees, just don't want to be forced to come back into the office five days a week. People are moving. So we have seen, so in Victoria, if you, where we're based, if you don't know, we are the most locked down city in the world. So we had an inordinate number of days where we were in various stages of lockdown, which is really quite sad. A lot of people have left Victoria. 
So they are leaving, they're quitting their jobs because they are moving interstate. A lot of people have moved to Queensland in Australia. We had one person from our IT team leave because his wife lost her job, wasn't able to get a replacement job. So they moved back home, which was about two and a half hours travel away. So he's gotten a job closer to where his new house is going to be. But that migration component, that is also a big driver of people leaving their jobs. We're also seeing that some people are questioning their careers and they're, they've looked at all of the time that they've been locked up, all of the stress that's gone on with the pandemic, and they're thinking, is this what I want to do for the rest of my life? So there is an element of this. We, a lot In the media, a lot of people talk about this as being that big reason. We don't see it as being the number one reason, but it is definitely something that people are thinking about. Now, one of the things that's really interesting is there's been a few studies that talk about what has been going on with the Great Resignation and where people have sort of landed once they actually have taken that move. The United States, I think, as far as the movement, the exodus of people out of jobs, are leading a lot of nations. I think they're they're definitely six months ahead of Australia. And figures in the United States are suspecting that a third of people are not comfortable with the choice that they've made. So they're either looking to go back to their original employer, or they're looking to move on to a third employer. Now, potentially, these are the employees who maybe weren't that good in the first place. And I know a lot of workplaces have been, uh, you know, that little bit more stressful, a little bit more focused on cost as well. And so you do tend to see some of the people who are at the bottom of the ladder sort of drifting away because of the pressure. And some people are definitely finding that the grass isn't greener on the other side. So there's a few things in there that you want to be thinking about. From our point of view, we always make in our leadership team, it's our job to be the employer of choice for the people that we need, for the resources that we need. I've spoken to uh, to business owners and they've said, you know, it's really, really difficult to hire at the moment. But I think I wouldn't like to work for you. And I know some of their management practices. I know some of the way that they treat people. It's not really that great. You need to be thinking in your business about the resources that you're going to put into building your team, your culture, your vision, your mission, all of those sort of things. Because I think now I've had this discussion with a range of business owners and they, it is definitely a business decision, but some people treat their staff differently to others. And I think that if you treat people with dignity, bring them along on a journey, pay them a little bit better where you can, then you're much better placed to retain people and you're much better placed to have people who want to work in your business. I think that that's a really big differentiator between successful businesses and businesses that aren't quite as successful because hiring, retaining and firing really key decisions and it impacts everything in the business. If you're hiring a lot of people, then you're going to be spending a lot of time on training. So your profitability goes down the tubes. If you've got a team that isn't overly engaged, then your customer service is not going to be where it should be. And so your profitability, your cost to acquire a customer is going to be a lot higher because you need to attract a lot more customers because you're burning out. Then they're not working with you on a regular basis. So the first thing that I think that everyone should be looking at in their business is retention. You want to minimize the number of people who are leaving your organization. And if I think to our business, we've had a significant amount of turnover. Particularly, this is something that's quite unusual for us. We turn and burn people relatively frequently, but I would say that 90% of those people are people who have worked with us for less than 12 months. So we, we put a lot of effort into training people, but our company isn't for everyone and they're not for us some of the time. So we do turn and burn the less than one year old, you know, sort of at six months, you're kind of moderately comfortable. But after 12 months, you've got a really good idea. After that, the retention of our staff who've been with us for more than a year, then the average length of of our team is around eight or nine years, which is great because we've got a lot of people who we've onboarded successfully and who share our culture. We've had a number of people who've left in that space, which is really quite unusual for us. That might happen to us once every couple of years, each of them for different reasons, each of them really quite sad reasons, I think, and none of them really because of the 
you know, so one of them was moving. One of them moved because his spouse had a significant medical issue. So there's a couple of stories in there. But at the end of the day, that rate of which people are leaving, they need to be replaced. You need to be going out into the market. You need to be looking at all of the things that you need to do. So when you're looking at retention, flexibility in the workplace where possible. So in a restaurant, that is going to mean shifts. It's going to mean a what about where people are working. Are you sitting down and talking with your team members to work out what it is that they want? One of the things that I think is quite useful, we try and sit down every 90 days with each person in our team and we just ask them, you know, how's everything going? What is there that we could do to help you be a little bit more epic? What issues have you got? And I think often things come out of that that we're able to work on or we're able to fix and that really helps in in that retention process. Now, the next one is pay. So there is a scarcity of labor. That's obvious. We're also seeing a significant amount of inflation. So in Australia, uh, 5.1% inflation, which uh, scarily, most of that was in the last quarter. So it's going to be really quite uh, disturbing as we see interest rates go up. But we're starting to see this you know, around the world. Fuel prices are going up. Housing is going up. Food is going up. A lot of those hard to get components because maybe they're manufactured out of China and China's struggling to export. There is a huge amount of inflation out there. And that's going to put, so you've got a high inflationary environment with a labor constrained market, which means that it's going to be really hard to attract people. And this is why that, so the number one thing I think that everyone needs to be thinking about doing is putting their prices up. I've spoken to a couple of restaurant owners who have said, well, you know what, we don't think that we can put our prices up. And it's like, you've got to be crazy. Your staff are going to be really struggling if you're not giving them pay rises. You need to be really thinking about paying above award rate because the cost of living has gone up 5%. So their pay packet has gone down 5% if you're not giving them a pay rise. On top of that, all of the other input costs. On top of that, restaurants aren't even open. We've been out. We've been walking down streets where places are closed on a Sunday because they it's not profitable to be there. So if there was one restaurant open, they would have been filled because everyone would have been in there. All it takes is one person to put their prices up to cover that and everyone would have gone in there. It would have made a fortune. This is something that everyone needs to be thinking about is being on the front foot with pay rises and critically, the prices for the goods and services that you're producing. And I think this is something that we are going to see a lot of over the next 12 months, the prices going up and up and up. And that's why reserve banks around the world are starting to put up uh, interest rates. There's going to be quite a lot more of that. So we're definitely across all of our companies, we're looking at the prices that we are charging uh, because they will need to go up. Now, the next thing that we want to look at is the operations within the business. So for your typical restaurant, what is there that you can do to cut out your cut down the number of staff that you have on a shift? Is it, you know, front of house? Do you want to start introducing order from table, order from the counter? It's interesting because I see that People talk about this and they say, oh, you know, these are old arguments, but this is the way that we run our business. And it's like, but hang on a sec. You're telling me that you can't get staff. You're telling me that you've done everything and there are literally no staff. So something has to give. There's got to be something that you're going to do that is going to change. Otherwise, you're going to go out of business. So you have to be thinking about everything that gets done in your business in a way that is going to enable you to achieve the outcome, you know, of, you know, getting the goods and services in the hands of your customers in a cost-effective way. We are seeing restaurants that are changing their menu so that they can have less cooks. So they're getting rid of the menu items that take a long time to prepare. They're going with a simpler menu. And that's for two reasons. One, it allows them to have less cooks on a shift but also it means that their training liability is a lot lower. And this is the next thing that we think about. When we're looking at hiring, you need to be thinking about getting in entry-level positions because this is the one place where there's probably a number of opportunities is looking at those entry-level positions. There are a lot of businesses out there that are taking a position that would have required two or three years worth of experience And they're either accepting that the fact that they're going to get someone who's going to do it without that experience, or they're changing the job, they're changing the products, the goods and services that they offer, so that they're then able to get that out 
with pretty much entry-level staff. Now, this is a big thing. So there are entry-level people out there, but it really means that you're going to have to front load your training and your mentoring. And like I know in our business, it's hard to get a structured mentoring program going. Our process of sitting down with everyone, having those chats, we try and overweight those in the new guys because the, and girls because they're the ones who are likely to have problems. But yeah, we're always trying to, to see how they're going. And we're always working on our training program for new hires so that we can get someone up to a level where they're really quite useful to the team as quickly as possible. So have a think about your entry-level positions and think with a clean slate of who can do that job because you you might be surprised at what you can get entry-level people to do. And I know it is happening across a lot of industries where you're getting uh, people are getting entry level people to do jobs that would normally have quite a bit of experience and they're just creating a two or three week training program to get people up to speed in that. The other thing is change the work that needs to be done. Now the second thing I think is really quite interesting is advertising. So when a job comes up in our organization, I want people to be uh, people who don't work here. I want them to be excited. It's like wow. I want to be an aspirational employer. I want people to go, I would like to work for them someday. And that does a couple of things. So one of the things that I'm always really keen on is building a bench of people who want to work here. So we are always advertising about what Extreme Networks does or marketing for restaurants because people will be like, I would like to work there. I do a similar sort of work. My company doesn't do those sort of things. Uh, So to give you an example, we've just booked 30 tickets to go out and see Top Gun. So first dibs goes to all of our great team members. They'll be able to bring their partners because, you know, we're a family business and it's important to get that spouse's buy-in on the, the value proposition. Then it's going out to some of our customers as well, our key customers. Many businesses don't do that sort of thing. For our team in the Philippines, we are flying them all into Makati for a two-day training session. So let's go back to what we were talking about when we're hiring people, a training session. We're going to be going through running training. Um, that, and this is a big, you know, it's a significant cost for us, but a key part of our business, a key part of our strategy. And that's why we're putting the resources in to be able to make that happen. So think about the advertising, whether it's just a team building event that you're doing, make sure that that goes up on Facebook, make sure that you're running an ad to it, targeting the kind of people who you would want to work in your business. I've seen this work really well with restaurants. If you have a restaurant that focuses on gluten-free food, then ideally all of your staff would have celiac disease because they're going to be able to build a relationship a lot better with the customers who come in. They'll all have stories to tell. There'll be a common language with that. So businesses that do that advertise to people with celiac disease so that they know, and then they can say, hey, we're looking for someone to do a few shifts a week because they're being flexible in what they're looking for. That might've been a job that was 30 hours. Now they're prepared to take on two people and split a few shifts across the week. They're able to take uh, people who they've widened the number of people who have, who are eligible for that role. And importantly, they are reaching out to people who would be like, you know what, I would like to work there. Particularly if they've eaten a couple of times, those members can be really, really powerful and they tend to stay longer as well. If you're going to be spending more time on hiring people and training them and hiring, I sit in on at least one of the interviews for each team member. Uh, So, you know, I'd like to think that my time's relatively expensive. I spend a lot of time on hiring. It's really expensive to hire. We spend quite a bit of time on training. It's expensive to hire. So everything that you can do to improve your retention feeds into profitability and it also feeds into employee success. So the point of the advertising is to build a bench. What we want to do is have a group of people who, when we are ready to hire, when we are ready to hire, then want to be able to do is to reach out to people and say, hey, we've got a position and you know, you've got three or four people who know the business, they know what it is that we do, they're a fan of it, they're educated about what it's like to work here, they would be like, they're the ones putting their hands up and saying, I would like to work there. And I think this is really critical because it enables you to have much better candidates. So it's interesting, I was talking to someone and he said, oh, you know, we're really desperate. We keep putting ads up on Seek. So Seek 
It's like Monster Jobs or you know, it's one of those employment websites. In the Philippines, we tend to use job sites a little bit more, but we're working on getting away from that. In Australia, we have not used a job website for probably five years now. There's a couple of reasons for that. Firstly, people who are looking for a job on a job website, they're probably unhappy with their existing job. Now, they could be unhappy for a couple of reasons. One, their employer might not be very good. Their manager might not be very good. They may have developed their skills to the point where they are better. You know, they're looking for the next challenge or they might not be very good. And when they say, oh, you know, my manager's not very good, is that because their manager does things like ask them to do work or gives them direction or gives them corrections about, you know, I would like to see you perform this task better? Because there's, we've seen a lot of people in the bad old days when we used to use job boards, it was very difficult because you'd get a lot of people who would tell you an amazing story about how good they were. In reality, not so much. What we like to do is to get people who haven't actually thought about having a new job. They're the ones, ideally, they've got a, a good skill set a good attitude, and they're looking for the next challenge in their career, whether that's into a new industry and they're looking for one of our entry-level positions, or if they're looking for a a trading up, you know, so they're going from that entry-level position to an experienced position or to that expert kind of role. But it's really important to build that bench and to build that brand of the organization that you've got because it makes it easier to hire. We want the jobs to be as attractive as possible. And I say this all the time. We are in a war for talent, so and it's good to win wars. It's important to win wars. If someone else is getting all of the great talent, then we're going to struggle to provide the goods and services that we do for our customers in the best way possible. So it's really important to get the best people. And by and large, I think we do a pretty good job of that. What is the vision for your business? What is the mission? What is the culture What are your values? Critically, what are your values? So within our group, we've got four values, fun, learning, ownership, communication. When we write a job description that we would use in a job ad, we go over it and say, and we sprinkle those in there. You know, we like to have fun within our team, be committed to lifelong learning. You'll take ownership of customer issues. You will welcome open and honest communication. You'll be a great communicator. Now, We don't have them listed out as these are our values. We have it sort of sprinkled around through the job so that it will reach out to people who share that. And more importantly, people who don't like taking ownership or people who who don't want to share our values or don't share our values, they're less likely, yeah, you know what, this company doesn't sound like it's for me. So that's why it's really important to make sure that you're hiring the right people, but you don't want to be wasting time on the wrong people. So be really clear. And in that job description, what are the KPIs for that job? What does a successful day look like for that person? All of those sort of things. We want to be really open and honest. Open and honest communication is one of our values. And in the job interview, we always try and be upfront with that. I, in the job interview, I tell people why people leave our company and the issues that people have in working for us so that They can go, oh, you know what? I do that. I probably wouldn't fit in here or that's fine. I'm going to be able to take care of that. That wouldn't be a problem for me. The pay rate, you know, have a think about what you can do as far as as pay rates. And we know that profitability is a massive issue, which is why I think the number one thing that many, many, many businesses need to do is put their prices up. A lot of the time in a lot of industries, people are constrained for supply. Now, whether that's labor whether that's the goods, whether it's hard to get food in, whether it's hard to get uh, cooking or someone out in front of house, all of those things, they're hard to do. There are people out there with money to spend. You know, think about your target market. Think about who your ideal customer is. Whoever that person is, they're the one, that's what you need to be thinking about how you're going to attract them. If you put your prices up, many of your customers probably aren't going to be too concerned. That's going to leave you a little bit extra. And I find it really interesting because in some industries where everyone pays the same rate, then you can pay 5% more. And that makes a really big difference, you know, particularly in jobs that don't pay particularly well. For knowledge workers, it's a little bit different. It's more about the flexibility of the work and it's around the kind of work that actually gets done. 
I was talking to one of our developers and he said, you know, this is really exciting because these are the projects that I like to work on, projects that are actually going to do something and make it make a difference for people. This is what I like doing. So for him, it's about working on meaningful projects and actually shipping code out that's going to get that's going to get used as opposed to, you know, many software projects, they just sort of like die because despite all of the time and effort that goes into them, they never actually get used. He likes writing stuff that's going to get used. So we sort of highlight that back to people, you know, hey, look, this is happening with some software that we wrote, you know, share those wins, build that culture, because that culture is really important for the business in the retention piece. But the last thing that I would say is don't discount the value of word of mouth. If you've got a strong culture, then people are going to know people with the skills that you want. And, you know, for us, it's quite tricky because we've probably got about eight clearly defined skill sets that we need. So that's a lot of people across a lot of things. And some of them, you know, we contract out the majority of it. Other bits that were their core capabilities where we keep it in-house we might have five or six or, you know, maybe 10 people in that job role. They'll know people who do the exact same thing. There'll be people that they went to school with, uni with, the people worked with in other jobs. Are you offering some sort of bonus, some sort of benefit for people who bring those people in? Because the thing that I think about is what is the value that someone creates? A lot of bosses will think about, oh, you know what, this person costs me this much per year. And you know what, we do that as well. But you've also got to look at the other side of the coin. What is the value that that person brings to you? And, you know, it goes back to training. I know there's a little quip from someone who said, uh, was asked the question, what if I spend all of this money, uh, time and money training someone and then they leave? And he said, what if you don't train them and they stay? What is the value proposition for each and every employee in the team? And I, I talk to our team. I encourage them to think of themselves as like the the owner of a company that employs one person and it only has one customer and that's that's our group. What is it that they're doing there? Are they improving their capabilities? Because there's people always out there who are trying to learn something new. How does that relationship work out? How do they articulate the value that they create? If you think about the value that you create, sorry, that each team member creates, then that's when you want to start thinking about building them up, enabling them to increase the amount of value that they're going to create. Word of mouth referrals, if you've got a team with a strong culture, they'll be like, I know someone and they would fit in really well. And they know that they're not going to, or you know that they're highly unlikely to refer someone that's a bit dodgy because it reflects badly on them. So there you have it. My top three pieces of advice. Firstly, look at your retention issue. I think that's a really big thing. Secondly, conduct a whole of business review around what it is that you get labor to do in your business and are there ways that you can be more economical with what is now and likely to be a scarce resource for the next potentially 24 months. I know in Australia, we are a half a million people who would have immigrated into Australia short. That means that now probably at least one in five, maybe one and a half in five of those would have joined our workforce, maybe a little bit higher. I'm not sure on that, but it's at least one in five. That's 100,000 people that our workforce is short. And I think we need to think about that. It's There are no quick and easy solutions to this. The last one, think about why someone would want to work for you as opposed to any other business that they could work in. And then Firstly, if you don't have a good answer to that, then you need to go and think about your value proposition to your valued team members. Uh, You know, talk to them, talk to people, talk to people who are looking at jobs, talk to people who work at other places. What is it that makes it attractive? When you settle on your unique selling proposition for talent in your team, go out and tell everyone about that because that is going to attract the kind of people that you want working in your team. And we all, as business owners, we need to be driving that. It's something that we need to be pushing all the time. I've said to our senior leadership team, we need to be spending about 20% of our time on hiring because it is the most important thing that we need to do uh, to achieve the goals in our business. And I, I talk to a lot of business owners and many of them are in the exact same boat. 
So that's about it. It is tough times out there. Uh, Don't beat yourself up too much about it. Really try and have a think about what it is that you can do a little bit better. And, you know, my thing is, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Just try and come up with that one little tweak that's going to make your business a little bit better today. If you can execute one of those things a couple of times a week, then, you know, within four weeks, you're you're going to be able to start to see perceptible differences in your business, in your day-to-day workload. And that's what it's all about. So that's about it. Keen to, if you've got any ideas, uh, any things that we've missed out on this, then really keen to hear them because this is something that everyone is struggling with. So yeah, keen to share the knowledge. One quick favor, if you've got anything out of this podcast, I like to think that there's a few good knowledge bombs in there, just uh, experiences that we've got, then please leave a review on your favorite podcast player for the podcast. It really does help us get the word out there. And, you know, I think getting more people listening to the podcast is a great thing because we've got lots of knowledge in here. So anything, that, uh, if you if you see it come up on social media, like, share, tag someone in on it. A uh, little bit of word of mouth is always a great thing as well. And we hear that from so many people. Oh, a mate or a competitor or someone just down the road told me to listen to this podcast. And yeah, so thank you for sharing the word. And if you got something out of it, please keep doing that. That'd be great. You have an outstanding day. Bye. Want more customers for your restaurant, cafe or takeout? Every month, our marketing tools and information are used by thousands of restaurant owners just like you to help them find more customers and turn them into repeat customers. All of our tools and information is designed specifically for restaurant owners. We know you don't have a lot of time to spend marketing or learning complicated procedures, so our tools are quick and easy to use. If you're looking to increase your revenue and profits or want to work less hours, check out marketingforrestaurants.com.